we turn to the word of God and the translation we're using for Paul's letter to the Galatians is on the yellow sheet. Since going to press, there are three minor alterations uh, that one has felt led to make. So may I suggest that you take this home and that you improve on it. A nice little Sunday afternoon devotional exercise. You rewrite it in your own language and uh, neaten the grammar and just make it more meaningful to yourself. Galatians 1.10 to 2.16 My dear brothers, I must make it quite clear to all of you that the good news I tell is no human tale. I neither heard others relating it nor did anyone pass it on to me. I got it direct from Jesus the Messiah as the events of my life prove. You must have heard about my earlier career in the Jewish religion. In my extreme fanaticism, I was hunting down God's company of Christian believers and playing havoc with them. As an ardent supporter of Judaism, I forged ahead of many fellow nationals of my own age because I was so enthusiastic about the established customs of my ancestors. Then God took a hand. He had marked me out before I left my mother's womb and generously chose me of all people to show what his son was really like, especially those I used to call foreigners. At once I decided not to seek anybody's advice, so I did not go to Jerusalem to consult those who were already working as emissaries of the Lord, Instead, I went off alone into the Arabian desert to think it all over. And from there, I returned straight to Damascus. It was not until three years later that I finally got to know Peter in Jerusalem. But I only stayed a fortnight and saw none of the other apostles, though I did meet James, our divine leader's own brother. As God watches what I write, I'm not making any of this up. After that, I went to various places in Syria and Cilicia, so the Christian gatherings in Judea would still not have recognized my face. All they knew of me was hearsay, that their bitter enemy was now spreading the very beliefs he had tried so hard to wreck. And they thanked God for the transformation. Another 14 years passed before I paid another visit to Jerusalem. This time Barnabas and Titus went with me. It was God who prompted me to go and have a private discussion with the reputed leaders of the Jewish Christians. I intended to check with them the gospel I had been spreading among other nations, lest all my efforts were being wasted. I took Titus as a kind of test case, for he was a Greek Christian. But they never once insisted that he go through the initiation rite of being circumcised. In fact, the question would never have arisen, but for some interlopers who had no right to be in the meeting at all. They sneaked in to spy on the freedom we enjoy in our relationship with Christ. They were looking for some way of getting us back under the control of their system. But not for one minute did we give way to their demands, or you would have lost what is truly good news. As far as the apparent leaders were concerned, their exact position doesn't bother me, for God pays no attention to status. I mean those who were obviously looked up to by the others. They added nothing whatever, to the teaching I had outlined. On the contrary, they could see that I was as qualified to take the good news to uncircumcised people as Peter had been to the circumcised. For the same God who was working so effectively through Peter's outreach to the Jews was obviously doing the same through mine to the Gentiles. James, John, and Cephas Peter was using his Hebrew name, seemed to be the three mainstays, and when they realized how much God was blessing my work, they shook hands with Barnabas and myself as a token of 
full partnership on the understanding that they would concentrate on the Jews and we on the non-Jews. The only plea they made was that we should not forget to send financial aid to poor Jewish Christians and I was more than ready to go on with this. But a serious crisis arose when Peter returned our visit and came to Antioch. I had to oppose him to his face, for he was clearly in the wrong. It was like this. When he first came, he was quite happy to eat with the Gentile converts. Then some colleagues of James arrived, and Peter was afraid of what they might think. So he began to have his meals separately. The other Jewish believers pretended to agree with him, and even my friend Barnabas was swept into the hypocrisy. When I saw that such behavior could not possibly line up with the reality of the gospel, I said to Peter in front of everybody, You are a Jewish national, yet you were willing to drop your scruples and adopt Gentile customs. Why all of a sudden are you trying to make them adopt Jewish customs? You and I were born within God's chosen people, not among the outsiders of other nations. Yet we discovered in our own experience that a man can never get into a right relationship with God by keeping his laws, but only by putting his whole trust in Jesus the Messiah. So even we Jews believed in Jesus Christ to make us innocent in God's sight rather than trying to achieve it ourselves by doing what the law commands. It could hardly be clearer that no member of the human race will ever get right with God by trying to live up to his standards, whatever his heredity may be. For 2,000 years now, people have been criticizing Paul for spoiling Christianity. And they have tried to drive a wedge in public opinion between Jesus on the one hand and the lovely simple gospel telling us how to live and Paul on the other with his complicated theological system, his letters, many of them hard to understand. Lord Beaverbrook was one of those who tried to drive this wedge. He was the owner, as you know, of the Daily Express and he wrote a book on the life of Christ. He called it the divine propagandist that said more about Lord Beaverbrook I think than the Lord Jesus nevertheless this is what he said in that book he said that Paul was responsible for changing the simple gospel and that following St. Paul the church has misunderstood and misrepresented Jesus Christ for nigh on 2,000 years he said of Paul he was incapable by nature of understanding the spirit of the master and that he damaged Christianity and left his imprint by wiping out many of the traces of the footprints of his master. I always find it interesting that those who want to divide Paul from Jesus in this way invariably call Jesus master rather than Lord. They talk about the master maybe because Paul loved to talk about the Lord Jesus and you can tell someone who loves the teachings of Paul because they talk about the Lord as he did but those who tend to use the phrase the master tend to go back as it were to the four gospels Matthew Mark Luke and John and say that's where I get my Christianity I've no time for Paul even scholars have been known to talk about the Pauline gospel as if somehow this was different from what Jesus taught. And it may well be that the first time you read Paul's letters, you found them much tougher going than the Gospels Matthew, Mark and Luke wrote for you. And maybe you even were tempted to think that there was a difference. And that you as a Christian are to believe everything Jesus taught, but that you're perfectly free to pick and choose among Paul's teachings. And you can say, oh, well, that was only Paul, or that's what Paul said, but I follow Jesus Christ. I've heard all this. Indeed, someone once said to me who didn't know that we preached the whole New Testament here, 
So doesn't Guildford get sick of St. Paul and wouldn't they love to have some gospel preaching? Well, there it is, up to you. I don't think that person realized we went through the four gospels just as much as we go through Paul's letters. But don't you find this popular division in people's minds between Jesus and Paul? As if Paul somehow took a beautiful flower and by analyzing it and dissecting it and pulling the petals to pieces, destroyed something fragrant. Do you know they were saying that 2,000 years ago? Poor Paul has suffered from this from the very beginning. And the people who followed him around, these false teachers that we are considering while we study his letter to the Galatians, these false teachers were saying, you know, Paul has given you a garbled account of Christianity. Paul has twisted it, he's distorted it. Some of what he says is right, but some of what he says is way off beam. We've come to teach you the whole truth and to put it all right. And poor Paul suffered from this. The only difference was this. Today, people say that Paul distorted the gospel by making it up himself. In those days, they were saying that Paul had distorted it because he'd got it second-hand. He didn't get it first-hand. He wasn't one of the original twelve apostles. He didn't walk with Jesus. He wasn't there at the cross. He wasn't there at the resurrection. He got it all second-hand, and when you pick up a thing second-hand, it's liable to have changed, and he's got it garbled. The modern version of saying this is this. At a house squash only last week, week before last, I was speaking to 50 or 60 people not far from here, and you know one of the questions that somebody asked? It's an old, old chestnut. As soon as I quoted part of the New Testament they didn't like, or that didn't fit in with their ideas, they immediately said, ah, but how do we know we've got an accurate copy? How do we know it's come down to us accurately? I notice they only say it with texts they don't like. Where they like a text and it fits in with what they believe, they're perfectly happy to quote it against me. But if it's something they don't like, then how do we know it's accurate? How do we know it's come down to us? And this is how the human mind evades the challenge of the gospel. If we don't like it, we say, well, how do we know it's accurate? How do we know it's been passed on in all its fullness? How do we know that's what Jesus said? And so they were saying of Paul, how do you know? Paul got it second hand, so you don't know that he's got it accurately. And we've come to give you the true version of Christianity. Now, what's Paul's answer to that? It's very simple. He said, I didn't get it secondhand. What I told you was no human tale. I didn't hear somebody else preaching it, nor did somebody else preach it to me. I got it direct from Jesus the Messiah, and you can't get it more direct than that. If that claim of Paul is true, then nobody dare ever say that I can't accept what Paul says, I only accept what Jesus says. You can never divide these two people if what Paul claims here is right. But if his claim is false, then not one of his epistles ought to be in the New Testament, not one. If he did not get the gospel direct from the Lord, then he is not an apostle, he ought not to be writing the New Testament and we can safely dismiss everything he said. Now that's the choice. And here we face Paul's claim to have got the gospel not from any human source but from a divine. That is not true of anyone in this room this morning. You got your gospel second hand. Every one of you, so did I. You either got it from the church or you got it from the Bible or from a Christian from the church or a Christian quoting the Bible. But you got it second hand. Paul got it direct and that's what made him an apostle, quite unique. I had the gospel passed on to me. Some of you had it passed on to you or you overheard someone else telling it. But none of us here this morning can say, I got it through no human channel whatever. I got it direct. From the Lord. You didn't. You got it second hand. But Paul says, I got it first hand. And that's his answer to this criticism that he garbled it. If he got it straight from the Lord, you can't say that it changed in the process of being passed on.
You can't say that people forgot bits of it or added bits of it. If you get it from first-hand sources, then it's accurate. Now, Paul has to prove this claim because his message is at stake. Now, let me just remind you, some of you here this morning were not here last week or the week before. Let me remind you what the false teachers were trying to say. They were following Paul round to the very churches he'd built and saying, he missed one thing out. He told you to believe in Jesus, but he missed out something terribly important. That is not enough. Faith only takes you part of the way. You need to believe and do something else. And the thing they said Paul had missed out was an initiation rite, a branding of the flesh called circumcision. They were saying Jesus was a Jew. Jesus was circumcised. All the twelve apostles were circumcised. If you have not been circumcised, you do not belong fully to the people of God. Now that sounds a simple little thing in itself. Why make all this fuss about a little operation that's over in a few minutes? And if, if they said that's the right way, well, why not submit to it? Paul says this, if you submit to this one little operation you are actually changing the whole of the Christian religion. You're changing it from a religion of believing to a religion of achieving. You're changing it from a religion that puts its trust in what the Lord does for you to a religion that puts its trust in what you do for the Lord. And that's a totally different religion. Because circumcision will lead you onto the law and the law will lead you into bondage and you'll go right back to the religion of trying hard to be good enough to get to heaven. And that's a miserable religion. Because the harder you try, the further heaven seems. And the further off you are. You don't know how bad you are till you've tried to be good. Can you remember that sentence of all that I say this morning? You will never know how bad you are until you really try to be good. It's only those who try to be good who discover they're bad. It's those who don't try who think they're good. But you try. Try as hard as John Wesley tried as a student in Oxford, rising at four in the morning to begin his religious exercises, visiting the poor and the sick, doing everything he could to be good enough for God. You try as hard as Martin Luther tried, whipping himself, whipping his own body in his cell in the monastery to try and be good enough to, for God and whip out the badness in him. You try as hard as some of the saints have tried, and then you'll discover how bad you are. And they who fain would serve thee best are conscious most of wrong within. Now, which religion are you going to have, says Paul? The religion of circumcision and the law in which you try and try and try and you never get there, and it's sheer bondage and it's thou shalt not and thou shalt not and thou shalt not. Or the religion of Jesus that says, put your trust wholly in me. It's what I'm going to do in you that matters, not what you do for me. It's a totally different religion. And so in saying that there was just one little thing that Paul missed out, circumcision, they were actually turning the gospel upside down. And, and Paul said, as we saw last Sunday morning, that that is a damnable heresy. A damnable heresy. But it's the religion of 90% of the people living in England. Do your best. Do your best. Do your best. But Paul came with a gospel of freedom, of liberty, of truth that sets men free and says, now it's the Lord who will get you to heaven, not you. Now it's the Lord you can trust, not yourself. And when you trust him, you discover how good he is. Not how bad you are, but how good he is. That's the difference. And his goodness replaces your attempted goodness. And when you stand before God, you don't present your own good deeds and say, Lord, I did this and that and the other. You stand before God and present the good deeds of Jesus in your place. And you offer his goodness. And that gets you in. That gets you in. Well, now, I said more in the introduction than I meant to say. I'm sorry. Let's uh, get back to the passage. It's a long one, too. Paul says, I'm going to prove to you by the events of my life that on the one hand, I did not get my gospel from anybody else, from the apostles. I didn't get it from them. 
But on the other hand, I'm going to prove to you that they agreed with my gospel. I got it independently, but it was not different. I got it direct, but it was the same as the one they preached. And so he selects five periods of his life to show these two simple facts. I didn't get it from men, but men agreed with what I preached. Now the first period he chooses is from the sad period of his pre-Christian life. And we have now a lot of personal autobiography. Do you know one of the best arguments you can ever use is personal testimony? If you really want to convince people of something, then say, this is what happened to me. And he selects five events in his life, five periods in his life. And the first was a period of contradiction in which he was totally opposed to Christianity. Now, he couldn't possibly have picked it up from Christians when he was totally opposed to them, could he? You don't go learning from people and then throwing them into jail. And in this period of contradiction, there were two things in his life. Number one, he was violently against Christians and he was violently for his own religion, Judaism. He looks back with sadness now, but it's a mark of forgiveness that you can talk about your past sins. If you can't talk about your sins, they're not yet forgiven. Think that one through. When your sins have been forgiven, you are free to talk to others about them without fear, without bitterness. And Paul could say, this is what I was like. You can only do that after you've received forgiveness. Because until you've been forgiven, you don't want to let people know what you like. But when you're forgiven, you can say, I'll be quite frank, this is how I used to be. And Paul says, let me tell you how I used to be. I'm sure you've heard how fanatical I was about my religion. I used to hunt down Christians. I used to go as a missionary against Christians. He even left his own country to go and fight Christians. It's one thing to go and be a missionary for Christ, but fancy going to be a missionary against Christ. But he was a missionary against Christ first, and he left his own country and he hunted them down. Men, women, and children, they met in fear. Everywhere Christians fled and met in secret. They said, Paul, is he on his way? And they feared they'd be thrown into prison. Paul got a name as the Christian's worst enemy. He was a missionary against Christ. And Christians were separated from their loved ones, thrown into prison, lost their life because of this man. He said, that's how I used to be. Do you think I picked up the gospel secondhand? Far from it. I couldn't stand them. And he said, as far as my own religion was concerned, you must have heard, I got ahead of most of my contemporaries. I really was a Jewish Jew, a Pharisee of the Pharisees, a Hebrew of the Hebrews. I got right up in my religion, further than most of my own age, because I loved the traditions of my ancestors. I loved to keep up their customs. I was just up to here in my religion. In other words, I had no intention whatever of becoming a Christian or preaching the gospel, none at all. That was my life, a life of stark contradiction. I want to say something now which will be particularly relevant to a few of you here this morning, but I think important to all of you to realize. All along, Paul knew one thing to be true, and that is that Christianity and Judaism as religions will never mix. That Judaism was the cradle of Christianity, but could easily become its grave. Now, let me say that in another way to make it clear. Our religion, the Christian religion, was born within the cradle of Judaism. We use the Jewish scriptures. All the apostles were Jews. Jesus was a Jew. Our future is bound up with the people of Israel. But Judaism as a religion will never mix with Christianity. And Paul realized he'd got to be one or the other. And that if he was a Jew, he will be against Christian Christianity. If he's a Christian, he'll be against Judaism. You can never mix the two. And that is why it is so hard for God's chosen people to accept Christ. They have to leave their Judaism to do so. And it really is tough. Very tough. You're leaving Judaism to follow a Jewish Messiah. That's the problem.
And Paul knew that they were utterly incompatible, in contradiction. That's why he tried to stamp out Christianity. Because if Christians were right, he was wrong, and he didn't want that. And it's been so ever since there has been this tension between Judaism and Christianity, and you can't avoid it, because it's there. They are two different religions trying to get to heaven by totally different ways. Now that's the first event in his life, and Paul says, how do you imagine I picked up the gospel from people I was throwing into prison? And when I was such a fanatical Jew, period number two, the period of contemplation, Paul believes in predestination. And the reason he believed it was the reason that I, your preacher this morning, believed it, and that is that it was God who made me a Christian. That's what makes Christians believe in predestination. It's not a theory, it's not a philosophy, it's a fact in their life. Then God stepped in. I didn't take the first step towards God. God was hunting me down. That's true of me in my own simple way. It's true of you if you're a Christian. Looking back now over your life, would you say that you chose God or that God chose you? The glory of it is that even though at the time you think you decided for Christ, you look back and you say, Oh Christ, that you wanted me. That you marked me out. It is a fact that Paul had no intention whatever of becoming a Christian, much less a missionary for Christ. Then God took over. And you know that God had been watching Paul before any human being had seen him. God had had his eye on Paul before his own mother had seen him. Because God watches us while we're in our mother's womb. He notices us when he's knitting us together in our mother's womb. And he'd watched Paul develop in his mother's womb and said, That's the man I want. That's the man I'm going to have. And he waited many years until this man had spent all his hatred on Christians. And then God met Paul on a road to Damascus on his way to kill some more Christians and he said Paul you're to be my missionary you're to be a missionary for Christ not against and you're to go to the foreigners not to the Jews you're to take me to the world and Paul says of, of all people me he chose me the greatest enemy of all but you know that's how God works I've told you before of one night I went to a youth club, there were 28 or 30 youngsters there, and I spoke to them, and when I came back, my wife said, how'd you get on? I said, well, most of them just couldn't care that much. It was like speaking to a brick wall, but there were two who were terribly cross with me. They were really angry, a boy and a girl, and the girl was so cross, there were tears in her eyes. She was arguing so hotly. So I said, I think there's hope for two. I think the Lord has his hand on two. I baptized both of them within six to twelve months none of the others that I spoke to that night it seems as if God says you're fighting me are you well at least you're interested and at least you've got energy and you've, you've got purpose right you're my man do you know Sunday school teachers find this the worst child in a Sunday school sometimes turns out to be the greatest Christian later there's a little comfort for those of you who've struggled <laughs> with a really difficult child but isn't this true and Paul says, that's the, God says, that's the man I want, Paul. And God took over and he stepped into my life. Paul says, do you think that was anything to do with me or anybody else? I didn't even have a missionary after me. I never had an apostle come and preach the gospel to me. God just stepped into my life. And because it was clear that God wanted to deal with me in a special way, I didn't even go and consult anybody. I didn't go and talk it over with the apostles. I didn't even stay in Damascus. I went off into the desert alone to think it over. He'd had a mental somersault, a revolution. He'd been totally opposed to Christ and now he was faced with the fact that Christ was right and he was wrong. What a moment. That's enough to turn a man insane. Except that it turned him sane. And he went out into the desert to try and think it all through. He went there for just under three years by himself. 
Those of you who want to get off into full-time Christian service by next Thursday at the latest, just remember, Paul went off for three years to think it over. That's why he could keep it up for 40 years and more later. And he went off to prepare, to think it through. And somebody has delightfully pointed out that all the other apostles had had three years with Jesus, so Paul went and did the same. He got alone. And the Lord told him many things in the desert. Do you know the Lord even told him about communion, the Lord's Supper? He wasn't even told about that by anyone else. Because in 1 Corinthians 11 he said, I received of the Lord what I delivered to you, how in the night in which he was betrayed he took bread and broke it. How did he know that that happened on the last night of Jesus? Jesus told him, nobody else, I received of the Lord. And the Lord told him all the gospel, all the Christian gospel, all that he was to believe and all that he was to preach. And Paul says, that's how I got it. And then I came preaching the gospel in Damascus. I went to no theological seminary. I was sat as a pupil under no apostle. I got it from the Lord in the desert. That's my gospel. And you tell me I've garbled it. You tell me I've got it second hand. You tell me I've muddled it because it was passed on to me badly. Then you're blaming Jesus for passing it on badly. I got it from him. So he came back to Damascus. And then being honest, he points from this period of contemplation by himself, contradiction with Christians, contemplation by himself. He then says, after three years, I had a conversation with Peter. I finally went up to meet him. But I only stayed a fortnight, so I didn't do a theological course even then. Didn't get my degree in Jerusalem. I just went up to say hello to Peter. And I didn't even meet any of the other apostles. Uh, James I did meet, the Lord's brother, but no, just a conversation, just a fortnight. So I still didn't go to learn anything from them. And then he says, you know, this may sound a bit incredible to you, but as God is my witness, I'm not making it up. This is how I got my gospel. It does sound incredible, doesn't it? That a man could go off by himself without a Bible and without a, a missionary or a teacher and could go off into the desert and come back with the whole of Christianity. Sounds incredible. But he says, I'm not making this up. I swear before God, God's watching what I write. He's my witness. I got it this way. And I just had a chat with Peter when I went up to see him. Now that settles one question, doesn't it? The question, where did Paul get his gospel? If he's right in what he claims, and as God is his witness, he's not making it up then you do not dare to question what Paul has said and say that that's not Christianity. He got it from the Lord. The other question is, well, all right, but did it agree with what the other apostles were preaching? Was it the same gospel or was it a different one? And so he picks out two more events in his life. He says, I went on preaching this gospel for another 14 years, all over the place. Everywhere I went... People came after me from Jerusalem and said I hadn't preached the true gospel. What to do about this? I know I'll go up to Jerusalem and we'll sort it out. He'd been a missionary for 14 years before he did this, but God told him to go. God prompted him to go. God said, Paul, go to Jerusalem and have it out with them. Go and see whether what you preach is the same. And Paul said, yes, Lord, I'll go. Now, I'll take Barnabas with me. He's a Jew, but he's a man of a big heart and a big mind. And he was big enough to see that Gentiles were now believers. And I'll take Titus, a Greek Christian who's never been circumcised, and see if they let him in. It was all a put-up job, if you like, but it was a very wise deputation. They selected three marvelous people to go. And those three were going to confront Peter, James, and John and the other leaders and have a consultation about it. And off they set. I want to tell you something now that some of you will know and realize, and that is that they went from Antioch, the three, Peter, uh, Paul, Barnabas, and Titus, to Jerusalem to meet Peter, James, and John. What was significant about Antioch? Just this, that it was in Antioch that for the first time people realized that Christianity was a new religion. And it was there that for the first time it got its label, 
Up till then, Christians had been regarded as eccentric Jews, a minority who felt the Messiah had come over against the majority who felt he hadn't, eccentric Jews. But in Antioch, Gentiles believed in such numbers that they realized Christianity was not a Jewish sect. And they were called for the very first time Christians, Christians at Antioch. It is that that marked out Christianity as a new religion. We are not eccentric Jews this morning, even though we use a Jewish Bible, even though I speak about a Jewish Messiah. We are not eccentric Jews. We are a different religion. We are Christians, Christians. And Paul took Barnabas, a Jewish Christian, and Titus, a Gentile Christian, and said, come on, God has told me we're going to have a showdown at Jerusalem. We're going to have this out. And they went up to Jerusalem. And they had a private meeting with the reputed leaders of the fellowship, and unfortunately, some interlopers got into the meeting, false brethren, shouldn't have been there at all. And they were clearly these people who'd just followed Paul around and spoiled his ministry and they got into the meeting and they said Titus has not been circumcised and Paul said we wouldn't yield an inch to those people they had no right to be there anyway we'd come to meet the leaders of the church and the leaders of the church welcomed Titus without any qualification praise God for that moment when the Jewish Christians were big enough to see that God was bigger than their little ideas. And there was complete harmony between the three and the three. And Peter, James, and John were just so thrilled with what God was doing. They said, Paul, put it there. Put it there. Let's shake hands on it. God is blessing you. Do you know that in the last analysis is what matters? Is God blessing that ministry? That's the important thing. Is God honoring it? God bless you. You look after the Gentiles, we look after the Jews, but we're partners in the gospel. We're not going to divide. We're partners. You're preaching the same gospel as we're preaching. And they added nothing, said Paul. They added nothing to what I had outlined. And you and I must never add anything to the gospel. I'll warn you that tonight we've got a very tricky subject coming up, Sunday observance. And I can see the corn sticking out already and I can see my big feet <laughs> paddling around tonight. It's one of those issues where we've been tempted to add something to the gospel and bring people back into bondage. And we'll be looking at that tonight. We're all guilty of it. The traditions of my fathers. This is the way we've always done it in this church and this is the way we're always going to do it. And that can lead to a fanaticism that divides Christians from one another. Praise God when we see that customs don't matter. The gospel is what we're agreed on, nothing more, nothing less. And if we're agreed on the gospel, we can shake hands with a person and say, even if God has called you to work in a different way, in a different sphere, God bless you, we belong to each other. We're partners, shake on it. And so this consultation made it quite clear that even though Paul got his gospel independently, it was the same one that the Lord Jesus gave Peter and James and John. That's proof that God was in it. And I will tell you this, that you can go up and down this land to churches of different denominations, different labels, and hear ministers who have never met each other and never been trained by the same people, and you can hear the same gospel. Isn't that marvelous? There are others where you will hear a different gospel. To me, the greatest proof of the unity of God to our land would not be churches with the same label outside all the way through and uniformity from Land's End to John O'Groats. The unity I'd like to see is this, so that you could go into any church building anywhere in this land and hear the same gospel. And if they worship the same Lord and listen to the same apostles, they preach the same gospel. What a unity that would be. So Paul says, I got it separately, but it was the same as theirs. Now comes the final event in his life, a rather sad and difficult one. The last few verses this morning, 
Paul relates an event which clinches his argument that his gospel is the right one. It must have been a painful event for him to recall and relate. It was the time when the two greatest apostles of Jesus had an argument, Peter and Paul. Their names have been linked even in folklore, even in Proverbs. Their names have gone down as the two greats in the Christian gospel. We have a proverb about robbing Peter to pay Paul. It goes back to this very same thing. Peter and Paul, the two great pillars, the two great founders of Christianity under Christ. And one day they had an argument. And Paul relates that argument to show that he even had to correct Peter's gospel. What a claim to make. This is how it happened. It's very simple. Dear old Peter reverted to type, as we all do from time to time, as Paul did on occasion. And Peter at heart was a coward. It was only the Holy Spirit gave him boldness. And Peter at heart was afraid of people. And that's why he'd once denied his Lord. A servant girl had made Peter scared by saying, do you belong to Jesus? And he denied that he did. Peter had this weakness that he was scared of what people thought. And when Peter came down to Antioch, he was perfectly happy. God had dealt with Peter in the matter of Cornelius. And God had shown Peter that Gentiles were just as much part of his people as Jews. And Peter came down to Antioch and he was perfectly happy to sit down and eat food that was not kosher, that hadn't come from a proper butcher. He was perfectly happy to sit down at a table and eat whatever was set before him and, and eat without washing his hands and eat Gentile food in Gentile ways because he was a brother with them. And then some other visitors came from Jerusalem and he got scared of what they would think. And the tragedy is he denied his Lord again. And when they came, he said, I'm afraid I think I ought to have my meal separately when they come. And so within the one fellowship, with one Lord, you had two Lord's tables. Because the communion service was taken at a meal, an ordinary meal. And they literally had separated at the communion table. And they broke bread separately. They acknowledged one Lord Jesus Christ and they couldn't sit down and eat together. And it was Peter's cowardice that did it. He was afraid of what people would think and he lost the courage of his convictions. Before we blame Peter, let's admit freely that you and I have done exactly the same thing. There have been situations when we knew what was right but we were just scared of what people would say or think and we fell, right? And Peter did it. And Paul saw that having achieved a unity of the gospel, if Peter went on doing this, there would for the first time be two denominations in Christianity. This was the first point at which two denominations could have started. The Peterites and the Paulites that had been called, that's what they would have been called. And so Paul, with great courage, said Simon Peter the first pastor of the church I rebuked him to his face and I said Peter what you are doing is not true to the gospel it doesn't line up you were perfectly prepared to eat with Gentiles when you came so this is not your true conviction you're doing it out of pretense you're doing it out of fear and Peter I rebuke you you're saying to these Gentile brothers, you'll have to get circumcised before you can come and eat with us. Eating together is a token of friendship and fellowship. And we know from other Christian bodies what devilish things follow when people refuse to eat with others. And Peter was doing this. Peter, how dare you? Don't you remember that we Jews had to believe in Jesus to get right with God? And so Paul, having started this passage by speaking of the source of his gospel, not human but divine, finishes by speaking of the substance of his gospel, not achieving but believing.
That's where I want to finish this morning because the last few verses of chapter 2 are so packed with goodies that it'll take us a whole Sunday morning just to nibble at them. So next Sunday morning we'll look at verses 15 to, to 21. Let us pray. Father, we would just never make it if you told us to do what we could. We praise you that Jesus has done what he did. And we thank you that this morning we do not come in cringing fear lest we have failed to meet your standard. We come in simple faith, trusting you to lead us in the paths of righteousness. For your name's sake. Amen.